The Sweet 16 for the Creighton basketball team. Hello, everyone. This is the Half Court Press podcast. Joel Lorenzi and Sam McEwen. We're not going to talk any Nebraska today. This is going to be a uh, full court uh, Creighton conversation. Uh, the Jays uh, back in the Sweet 16 trying to make history uh, by getting to the Final Four. The hipsters were apparently right because Creighton is here. Joel. Welcome back from Denver. How Appreciate was the Mile it. High City? It was great, and I, I love a fist pump from from Z uh, as he basically calls himself a hipster. <laughs> well, hey, I am uh, I'm thrilled that Creighton is there. Uh, it was a lot of fun to watch a team that we believed at the beginning of the season could be really good play in what I would consider its best game of the year yeah. against Baylor. And uh, so we're going to recap that game first. Uh, and talk about just the significance of playing really well on a big stage, and they did. And then the test ahead, which is one of the strange, strange, tough games in a weird way. Creighton's a 10-point favorite against the Ivy League darling. Hard to know exactly what that team's going to be on Friday, and then the potentiality of Creighton making the Final Four. All right, Joel, let's start with this. First of all, great coverage from the weekend. Appreciate Um, it. Uh, if people haven't read the Ryan Kalkrenner story that, that Joel wrote right before the NCAA tournament start, do that first. Uh, that I would advise that. Kalkrenner made that story look really good yeah. on Friday with an incredible game, and he played really good. They beat NC State. I think they. I think we would agree they were a better team than NC State on a for lot sure. Of yeah. And then on Sunday, uh, they draw third seed at Baylor, and they kicked Baylor's ass. They and, did uh, for thirty for thirty seven minutes. Yeah, yeah, right. Like it was pretty tight. I think it was ten to seven. Then Farrell Bill hits a three to go up twelve ten, and they 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 beat Baylor up and down the court, and a deeply satisfying win for for Greg McDermott. You could tell based on what happened nine years ago with Baylor knocking Creighton yeah. out in, in the uh, the second round. And, and, and he played it off before the game, oh, like he? Uh, he he made it seem like he wasn't dwelling on the connection, and maybe he wasn't. I don't know, but um, he definitely he felt it after the game. He talked about it. He, he said something along the lines of. You know, they they lost to Baylor nine years ago with a special team, and they beat Baylor that night with a with a special team. So you you know he he was thinking about it. He just had to do the the coach stuff and and act like he wasn't and and keep his sights on what was ahead. But yeah, it, it, you could tell it meant a ton to him. Well, he was feeling it. Yeah, he was feeling it in that post game press conference. I thought there was a lot of emotion that leaked out of him. He's not necessarily the most emotional guy you'll ever see. He's just this side of more expressive than Fred Hoiberg, who's maybe the least emotional uh, coach that I've ever covered. But um, but how do they – you've watched, you've covered this team all season long. You have seen them at their best, and you have absolutely seen them at their worst because you were in Las Vegas when they lost to BYU and Arizona State. How did they pull – how did they play so well on Sunday? Like what – what factors led into that, and was that the best that they've played all season long? Yeah, and, you know, McDermott has talked a lot about it being a make-shot, miss-shot game, um, and basketball is a game of variance. Um, you've No team has probably been more exemplary of that than, than Creighton this year um, because their shot makers, when they're on, they're among the best in the country. This, this starting lineup, this starting five, is rivaled by very few very few groups when, when they're on and when they're not. Um, it gets ugly sometimes. Um, earlier in the year, it was detrimental. It it, it meant losses. Um, and so, and this was against, I mean, dating back to Maui, um, you know, dating back to around that time, like Texas. Texas, I thought, was the first instance where people were like, uh, because really, I should say St. Thomas was the, the first that's instance. the season opener yes when people were like uh what's going on with the shot making like it was a little too close for comfort um that was probably the first warning that this team's floor could be what it's been and then texas was like okay they can do this against good teams too like this wasn't a one-time thing and then nebraska so yeah and so their floor nebraska's f- crown jewel of the year was beating great yeah and so they beat the- a sweet 16 team very true. And so um, the floor was there, and it's been spelled out by this team throughout the season. Now I think they've done a better job of not only consistently putting their ceiling out there or a product closer to their ceiling, but adjusting their floor or finding a better middle ground to where, you know, shooting 
three for 20 from three like they did against NC State didn't – it hasn't meant a loss in a mm-hmm. long time because they found ways to not only make defense their identity, but they found ways to pull out ugly games. They found out ways to win without shooting necessarily well. They've just found different ways to win since – not just since St. Thomas or Texas or Nebraska, but since Vegas, since the six-game losing streak. They found different ways to win. So now I think um, Baylor, that game, was just a complete summarization of how far this team has come and what it looks like when the shot making is there. Mm. Earlier this year, you were writing a really good feature story, and Jimmy Watkins was still here. He's now in Cleveland, but you were here, and he, and he was here, and we were sitting in that conference room going over your story on Ryan Nemhard. And I kept saying Montverde, remember? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, you and him kept correcting me and like, it's not Montverde, it's Montverde. Mm-hmm. And the reason I bring that up is it felt like all the th- experiences that Ryan Emhart has been through in his life, mm-hmm. the fact that he played with a brother who was really, really good, who's in yep. the NBA, the fact that he played with all these superstars at Montverde, I feel like we saw a little bit of Montverde on Sunday night. Like that's what Ryan Nemhard's experiences got him to was playing the best game of his life in the biggest game of his career. Yeah. And for what it's worth, I, I, I think Sunday was the Creighton version of Nemhard because at Montverde, um, he was a really good player, but he was PG one, like to the, to the exact definition of PG one. Um, often, you know, deferring as a scorer because he's playing with pros, Jalen Dern, um, that team that I mostly wrote about specifically in that story was Kay Cunningham, Scotty Barnes, uh, Moses Moody, right. Caleb Houston. You can go on and on. Um, so oftentimes he's deferring as a, a true point guard is what they would call it. And I think now he's stepped into this this thing where, like, he grows up with a brother who's who's a pretty good rookie. Um, he, he plays high school with some of the better young pros in the league. Yep. Um, and all of this, you know, culminates into this guy that could probably go off if he wants to. And I think um, last year when they started to lean on him more as a scorer here out of necessity um, was the first glimpse of like, okay, like he's been waiting all his life for this type of opportunity to to showcase both of those things. And um, you look at the season leading up to this point, um, he's controlled the pace in most of his games, I think. And – um, you think and that to, being a fast pace, yeah, and you, pushes, and you think back to Maui, how he erupted against Arkansas, yep. like the flashes have always been there of a guy that you know, given the opportunity, given the moment, like he could show up. And Maui against Arkansas and Sunday against Baylor are probably two of the biggest moments. Not probably, they are two of the biggest moments of the season, and he showed up. You could argue that that that, that Arkansas and. Um they were two of the three most athletic teams they've played, UConn being the other. Maybe Marquette, too. Yeah. You know. Uh, but but the fact that he, he seems to thrive in games where the the caliber of athlete and player on the other uh, on the other side of the court is is really high. Because Arkansas is in the Sweet 16. Yeah. They just beat Kansas. And they had good guards over there. Anthony Arkansas Black can go to the really Final Four. Freshman. They have Final Four talent. They sure. do. They didn't have Final Four focus all season long. But they're maybe the team that's closest to Creighton in terms of just what you see, what what the potential ceiling is, is really special. And and Nemhard was the reason they beat Arkansas, and he was he was a big reason why they beat Baylor. The game got a little loose at the end. Baylor scored a bunch of points, but I thought Creighton's defensive plan against Baylor was terrific. Yeah. And, the, and Mac brought it up after the game of like we didn't they made some shots from twelve feet away, but we knew they couldn't make. That many, and for people who like volleyball, here's the analogy that you would use in volleyball. What what Creighton was forcing Baylor to do is similar to what a great block in volleyball does. When you're not able to just hit cross court over and over, and you have to hit roll shots again and again and again, and a roll shot is just a little, you know, a little dink over the over the block. Baylor had to do that all night, and they couldn't. They couldn't score enough points because Creighton took away the three, and they gave him that little twelve footer, and it just. It wasn't enough. Yeah, and to to LJ Cryer's credit, that's some of the best shot making I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. And same thing with Quavion Smith. Quavion Smith was twisting and turning his body and hitting some absolute nut shit. If I'm being real, um, <laughs> but the, but it's not enough. You have yeah. you have to you have to hit threes. Yeah, and and really, um, I was stunned because with 
NC State, it was like, okay, you could let Taquavion Smith go off for the game of his life, look good in front of the scouts, probably what he would want anyway, um, and limit everybody else. Um, but with Baylor, it wasn't exactly that simple mm-hmm. because it's not L.J. Cryer and Adam Flagler or L.J. Cryer and Keontae George. It's all three of these dudes. No, they took George away. Yeah. They, they, well, he took himself. To, he didn't play well, but they took him away. A lot of that had to do with them. I, I was surprised some of those stops – Baylor Shireman got um, because obviously he hasn't been a premier defender. Right. Uh, at times he also hasn't been terrible uh, too often, and so there was a it was a bit of unpredictability to it. And um, he took away. He I mean he he was a big chunk of the reason why a future lottery pick had his worst game of the season. And I was frankly I was stunned by how well they they relatively limited. Flagler and, and George. Do you think he's going to come back, the George kid? I think no. he might. Hell no. There's no way. It. This is like uh, the only people that think he's going to come back, these are the same people that have been telling me, oh, Cam Whitmore is going to come back or Sharif Cooper was going to come back to Auburn two years ago. These dudes are being, well, Sharif Cooper kind of fell out of the range that he was supposed to. But um, if these dudes are top 10, top 14, um, I don't know why the hell they would come back. I mean, he doesn't owe Baylor anything, and uh, frankly, I don't, I don't, I don't know what. It's not like they have a a crazy juggernaut of a dynasty going forward that he would feel like he has unfinished business. Mm. So next up is Princeton, and this is tricky, right? Because Princeton's the number fifteen seed. Um, they had this epic finish to beat Arizona, which was framed as Arizona's collapse, which is fair. I think that's I think that's a reasonable take. Very fair. Um, Arizona's a good team. Yeah. Had a really good season, and they they fell apart in the last five minutes. Worst five minutes, obviously, of their season. And then they played Missouri, and Missouri was playing pretty well, in my opinion. Um, they had they had. I mean, in the last twelve games of Missouri season, regular season, and SEC tournament, I think Missouri was better than the seed that they had. I agree. Princeton beat Missouri badly. They beat them by fifteen. But the way they did it. It was convincing the whole the whole way. Yeah. So, you know, people's mindset of Princeton, I think their win over UCLA predates your birth, I'm pretty sure. A lot of stuff predates my birth. So they beat UCLA. The they were a four seed, and they beat UCLA as a 13 seed in 96 or 97. Yeah. 96. A few years before I was alive. And they beat UCLA 45-43. And it was, it was one of these sort of master classes of – Take the shot clock down to the last two seconds, backdoor pass, you know, um, Hoosier stuff. I mean, that's what it was. This Princeton team, to me, I mean, they blew by Missouri. And one of my friends sent me a text of like, Missouri's players are fat. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think they're just, I think they're big and athletic. But Princeton made them look slow. Princeton was quick. Yeah. This is a challenging team For in sure. its own way. What is the challenge that Creighton has in this game? Yeah, and first a note on, on Mizzou. I'm not necessarily happy they lost, but I just thank God we didn't have to open Pandora's box because the amount of questions I got asked about, oh, Creighton versus Mizzou, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a, a fantasy for you? Like, <laughs> like no, I'm no. not a – I'm not an MIZ Mizzou fan. I just I went to school there. It was cool. I covered the team, so I detached myself emotionally from them, right. um, which is what people should be doing in this position. Um, so th- no, I don't I don't care what could have been. Um, and for for what it's worth, Mizzou's best player was Kobe Brown. Uh, yeah. um, g- really great college player, like really really good college player. Uh, but he took them as far as they could have gone. I thought that team overachieved. Dennis Gates in his first year, really, really good coach mm-hmm. um, for the talent. You look at their talent. Um, they did more than they should have. Um, does that mean Princeton should have beat them? Probably not. But am I surprised? Hell no. Princeton, um, to be as undersized as they are, really physical, can really get on the offensive glass in, in sneaky ways. Um, undersized, obviously, but their strengths lie on being – Sneakily physical. They play good defense without fouling. Probably not as well as Creighton. No, nowhere near as well as Creighton. But that's obviously a, a credit to Creighton more than anything. Right. Um, but they still do a good job of playing bigger than they really are. They're 
So the thing that Missouri did is they tried to, I don't know what, press is the wrong word, but they tried to extend their pressure outward and take away the three-pointer. And they were burned. I mean, Princeton got by them, and there wasn't anybody at the rim. Creighton will have a guy at the rim, right? For sure. Ryan Kalkbrenner is a player yeah. that Princeton has probably not dealt with very many times this season. Although, I, you know, Arizona's got size. It's cha- I think that's going to be a challenge for Princeton simultaneously. This is one of those games, though, where mentally, if you get behind early, and Missouri did, and they never were able to get back. They weren't able to climb the hill. And I've seen Ivy League teams do this before. Nebraska's, in my opinion, Nebraska's second best basketball team ever. Fell behind early to a Penn team in 94 in the NCAA tournament, and they never got back. They lost 90 to 80, and it was a up and down game, and and Nebraska played well in stretches, but they never got back in that game. How important is a fast start for Creighton? Like to 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 be able to say we're Creighton and you're not, and just be up 10 after the first seven minutes. Yeah, it, it means everything. Um, but I will say. Being down maybe five early it might lead to a game that ends up closer. But I still think Creighton wins um, solely because, like, you you made a good point. Um, they probably haven't seen anything like Kalkbrenner, and that's becoming a theme for all the teams that, that yeah. Creighton runs, runs into. Because I, you ask these coaches, you know, have you seen anybody like Kalkbrenner in their season? You you talk to Kevin Keats if he's seen anybody in the ACC like Kalkbrenner. It's like, hell no, nobody defends the way he does, and even on offense, nobody is scoring without the ball the way he does. Yeah, Kalkbrenner made North Carolina State centers not – he did not play well. He made them look terrible. Yeah. And it he was really crazy did. because <laughs> DJ Burns was like a focal point going into that game with the, the skill, the ball skills, the playmaking, yeah, uh, the little 15-footer. Really and he, he, he could never check Kalkbrenner. No. The backup no. was even worse off. Oh, yeah. And so um, – and then you look at Baylor. Um, Baylor, I think, dedicated their entire – a, a chunk of their game plan to make sure he didn't do what what he did against NC State, and um, even still he got a few buckets here and there. But on the other end, it's like you've never seen a, a rim protector like this throughout your season. Right. Um, most of the Big Twelve teams, I'd say, uh, the the better defensive teams, they pressure the ball. They don't have a guy who can drop like this or who is meeting you at the rim like this, or at least to this level. So to Princeton's point, the Princeton, the best teams, Princeton. Has played. They're playing now. Arizona, Mizzou, um, and of course, two very good teams there. But they didn't play anybody in the season, so they right. damn sure didn't play a Ryan Cog winner. Um, so I think even if Princeton gets out to I don't know a, a five point lead that maybe feels bigger than it actually is, uh, possession after possession, driving head on into Cog winner, um, it'll it'll all boil down to that, and you know the, those leads dissipate when when you're running to that dude. I apologize for not being able to pronounce the 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 name of the uh, Princeton's best player, um, but he's a good player, um, and he he he's yeah Tosan uh, Tosan. At that part, I know. Uh, if Boyam, I'm not sure how to say it. Yeah, I heard it in the, their press conference yeah. the other day, but uh, he's a good player, and and so like they'll have to figure out how to stop him, and then they have three three-point shooters that they array around the court and they they spray it that guy specifically sprays it to them and they they'll either hit shots or they won't and then the thing that i think missouri the missouri game exposed is princeton's ability to blow by and they did they blew by missouri's defenders uh quite a bit um when you look at creighton's side of it i think if creighton plays a b game they win um and if they get if they get nine points from francisco farabello i'm not sure that they lose many games at all very true. That was it. It was very fortuitous for him to have his best game of the season against Baylor. If he doesn't make any of those threes, it's probably a one or two possession game at the end. Yeah, his three pointers changed the nature of that game. Yeah, and huge. A, and a few of them were demoralizing because it felt like on a couple of them he had more space than he probably should have. Maybe yeah. they went back and watched film, saw that he hasn't shot the ball to the standard he he would have liked this year, and it was like, okay, we'll let him. We'll see one go through the net, see where it ends up. And I thought they they did a great job of finding him. I mean, they often do, but in these these looks, I mean, he was he was confident. He stepped into them with confidence. He, uh, I think, by the third one, he had already walked off before the ball even went into the <laughs> net. Like, and then he had the <laughs> yeah yeah. It, Creighton was getting pretty uh, full of itself there at the end, which is okay. Okay, so if Creighton wins and they beat Princeton, we're not going to have another podcast before uh, after Friday's game. 
Um, you will have videos with Tom Chattel and all the rest. But here's the deal. If they, if they beat Princeton, it, it's very likely that what awaits them in the, in, in the Elite Eight is Alabama, one of the most untraditional number one overall seeds that I can remember. Um, they don't have the blue blood pedigree. Um, they haven't been there. Their coach hasn't been there. Like he has not, he has not been there. Um, this does happen sometimes. And, you know, there was a time when Jay Wright had to do this for the first time and he got there, but you know, Jay Wright didn't win the national championship until I think he had been to his third final four or fourth. Um, so it takes some time. I don't know if I, I don't, I don't personally consider Alabama the overall favorite to make to win the NCAA title. I don't either. I consider it to be Gonzaga, which is odd. Well, uh, but maybe the winner of the Gonzaga Houston game. Yeah, Houston. Uh, Houston is my pick. Yeah, that's been my pick all year. Uh, the the right side of the bracket looks harder than the left side at this point. But sure. Alabama waits, and uh, the the primary story uh, about Alabama basketball for the last month has not been the skill of its basketball team. Much like the 1995 Nebraska football team, the primary story about Alabama basketball has been off the court. And it has been uh, specifically a kind of, you know, and this this really followed Nebraska's football program throughout that entire year. Um, and they actually were galvanized by it. Like they, 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 they took something from that, um, from the, the many things that happened during that season, um, crimes that were committed, and they used it, you know, as internal whatever. Nate Oates has handled this very interestingly. He's kind of kept the team together. He probably could have suspended Brandon Miller. Um, you know, if you listen to Nick Saban yesterday, it sounds like Nick Saban would have suspended Brandon Miller, um, but he didn't. So Creighton has Creighton will probably have to play that team on the court. How good is that team? A really good team. Uh, both both sides of the floor, they're deep. Uh, they spend a lot of time behind the three-point line. I mean, it's been a, a signature for, for Nate Oates' teams at Bama um, while he's been there. You know, threes and layups. That's how they get off, and, and they get to him. They get to those shots. Um, they got into him this year probably better than they have under him, and they've had some pretty good teams under him. I mm-hmm. think this has been the best one um, maybe by far. And they've had – I mean, I think back to John Petty, uh, Javon Cornerly when he first got there. Um, they got dudes on his team, man. And Brandon Miller is a top five player in college basketball, which makes it um, very, very hard to to game plan for them because he's like a, a matchup nightmare with his size and, and handle and um, everything he can do and how he's progressively gotten better throughout the year. And so, yeah, they're, they're a top five defense in the country, uh, one of the better offenses in the country. You're just, just an all-around problem when, when you face them. Um, and, and Creighton will – We'll see that Creighton might be a little overmatched, um, but maybe they follow the same guidelines that they've had all tournament in terms of, you know, running Bama off the line, um, letting Brandon Miller go for 25, 30, and somehow gotten out a win. I, I, I think there is a reality. If I'm stepping back into my Doctor Strange role, <laughs> um, there are maybe, I don't know, two to 300 realities out of a 1,000 where that game plan works against Bama. If people want to know what Alabama plays like, they can very easily look at the uh, the idea, the ideology of Fred Hoiberg. Uh, the way that Fred wanted to play at Nebraska and it didn't work, and the way he did play at Iowa State is the way Nate Oates plays. How do we know that? Because one of Nate Oates' uh, assistants, Charlie Henry, is a Fred Hoiberg protege. And then Charlie Henry has now moved on to what school? I can't even remember. But he's got a different job now. Um, but... But uh, Nate is a guy that Nebraska would have strongly considered if Fred Hoiberg had said no. Um, that's kind of what they were looking for, and, and so it's interesting. Nate Oates comes from Buffalo. He's now at Alabama. Um, the last time Alabama was in the Elite Eight is 2004. I know nothing about that team. I couldn't tell you anything about that particular team. The previous time they were in the, the Elite Eight many, many years before that was when they had, and this is how long it's been, Latrell Sprewell. That's a pretty good name. That is. That's probably the best player in their, you know, school's history. I don't know. Brandon Miller might be coming for that. Might title. be. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Anyway, um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what's in front of Creighton. I mean, it, it, it's going to be a long shot uh, if they play Alabama. Alabama's team is really good. Um, they haven't been there. They haven't done this. It's going to be new to them. And so Creighton will not be playing a team. Uh just as an example, they won't be playing Gonzaga. 
They, they won't and be playing Gonzaga. Gonzaga is, may not be as good of a team, but Gonzaga's been there. They know it. So, but for what it's worth, like, I'll play devil's advocate here. The best teams in this tournament haven't been there, but it's, it hasn't lessened their chances of sure. getting there and winning the game. I mean, Houston has been um, – Houston's it's gotten far a, a few times. Yeah, Houston's yeah. gotten far a few times. I think that's sure. the best coach in basketball. But sure. the championship game, haven't been there. Right. Um, that's fair. You know, I look at Texas. Rodney Terry took over middle of the year. Yep. I can't remember the last Final Four Texas That's right. was in. Um, definitely haven't Chris been. Chris Clack was there. It was in 04. Sure. So, 03. Um, 03. Um, UConn hasn't been there with, with Danny Hurley. Um, I'm trying to think. Gonzaga's been to eight straight Sweet 16s, which yeah. is a, a very, Xavier hasn't been very, there, very impressive feat. Although their head coach has. Sure, their yeah. head coach knows. Yeah. But, but he hasn't been there with them. No, yeah. you're right. I mean, UCLA's got some experience, um, some of these other teams. I'm just saying that one thing that Creighton can, can, can count on going into Sunday is regardless of who they play in that game, that team's not going to be going into that game having any fewer emotions about playing in that game than Creighton would. Um, Alabama's going to have all the butterflies, even if they're a better team. San Diego State, which we haven't talked much about. Creighton knows all about San Diego State. Very true. They played them last year in the NCAA tournament, and they have played them many, many years in the Greg McDermott era because he likes playing them. So there's not going to be any mystery about San Diego State if they were to pull off a huge upset against Alabama. And I think we both agree that would be a huge upset. That would not. It would be. That seems very unlikely. It would be. I, I know people were in my replies about this uh, uh, over the weekend, but. It would probably be more stunning than Fairleigh Dickinson Purdue to me, uh, because <laughs> Not about that, but because I get you. I get you. I, this is the thing. I've been on record basically saying Purdue stinks for like two months, and so for it to come to fruition was like I was happy about it. Sure, but I I felt really good about my brain that day. I would be more surprised if San Diego State beat Alabama than I was when Arkansas beat Kansas. Because yes, the, the, for sure. The, the 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 talent level of those two teams. And the other thing is with San Diego State is they have to win. If they're going to beat Alabama, they'd have to win. They'd have to win 59-57, and I just don't see that happening. Okay, we're going to get out. Joel's got to go over to Creighton Availability. Um, okay, so let's just get a quick prediction. You think they're going to beat Princeton? I do. You think they're going to beat Alabama? I don't. Okay, there you go. We're going to have full coverage from Louisville this week. Joel will be there. Tom will be there. We'll have a, fo- a photojournalist, Anna Reed, there. So we'll have videos. We'll have commentary. We'll have all kinds of stuff from Louisville. It's going to be great. Listen, watch, read. Thank you, Blue Jays.